Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno. Proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. Walk along, you can see in the uh, distance here that we are coming up on the school. I visit the ruins of St. Thomas, a town that has emerged from the receding waters of Lake Mead. It's a critically endangered species. It's actually been called the most endangered mammal in North America. I'm in the Pahrump Valley where scientists are working to save one of Nevada's tiny creatures, the vole. It's just nice to be on the water, isn't it? Oh man. I'm dropping my line and crossing my fingers at the South Fork Reservoir. I don't mean to brag, but being the host of Outdoor Nevada means I have the best job in the world. Lake Tahoe is beautiful from every viewpoint, but nothing beats mine today. I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. It's the mid and I'm on a mission to show you the one of a kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. St. Thomas, Nevada is one of the few underwater cities that you can see at low tide. I'm out to explore. Sky, how are you? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Nice I, to meet you. I don't know about you, but this is a pretty good way to start the day, don't you think? Oh, this is a beautiful area of Lake Mead. This is where the little town of St. Thomas was established in 1865. Sky McLean is our interpretive guide for the day almost visualize it, I can almost see it. In the distance is basically where Thomas Smith and about 10 men and three women in January of 1865 arrived and set up a little supply stop right there in the middle of the valley. Life sure was different back then, wasn't it? Oh yes, it was very, <laughs> very different. You know, harsh conditions. This was a key area for them to settle because there was water from the Virgin River, from the Muddy River, and the Colorado River was about 20 miles away. But in uh, the late 1929s, they realized that the government was going to be building a dam 65 miles from here. And what ended up happening is this idyllic little town of St. Thomas had to be relocated because eventually it was going to be under 60 to 75 feet of water. Incredible. The Hoover Dam rises 726 feet from its foundation. It was constructed between 1931 and 1936, changing the course of St. Thomas's history forever. Is there any chance we can get a little closer? Sure. It's about a mile walk out. As the waters of Lake Mead threatened, St. Thomas residents had to abandon their beloved town. Where did they all go? Well, many of them relocated to Overton and Logandale, uh, which are just north of us. Some went to Las Vegas, some returned to Southern Utah. So they scattered like seeds. They scattered, but many of the families remained here in Southern Nevada, and you'll still hear their names uh, today, and many of them will come out and visit. The heart and soul of St. Thomas remains on the ruins time left behind. As we walk along, you can see in the uh, distance here that we are coming up on the school. And you can see it's quite a large foundation. It was three stories high. The St. Thomas School held up to 35 students before families had to relocate. There were a lot of other structures here at the school. There was the Gentry Hotel, which was also a three-story building, not too far away from here. The old uh, country store was, and post office were right next door to the hotel. Thriving community. Then they learn they have to move. They got to fold the whole thing up and get out of here. That must have been a heartbreaker for some people. I 
think there was a lot of disbelief. How could something that was 65 miles away from here affect this community? But the reality was it did, and people had to decide to sell back their property to the government. They had to start disassembling their homes and uh, moved away. How much was the government paying? What was the going rate for a town that you're closing down? $40 an acre for things that were unimproved, $75 an acre if it was improved. Probably a total of $500,000 for the whole community. Amazing. what the government paid. Do you think there was also maybe a sense of patriotism that we've got to do this for the good of the country? The Great Depression was occurring and people needed to go to work. They needed to control the Colorado River. So I think there was a certain amount of understanding. By 1938, everyone had left. The last guy in the canoe, who was that? He was in a small boat, uh, Hugh Lord, and that is the story that he stayed until the water was lapping at his doorstep and then he got in his <laughs> boat and paddled away. Hugh Lord, he always was a stubborn guy, wasn't he? <laughs> St. Thomas remained submerged for decades. Then, an ongoing drought spread across the Southwest lowering Lake Mead's levels and exposing the town's ruins. So when the water was receding, was this one of the first things that people saw? Yes, um, as the water started to lower, around 2002, people started to see the top of what we know now as the Hanig Ice Cream Parlor. A ghost town once concealed by 60 feet of water now welcomes visitors to discover its lost history. Sky, this has been awesome. Well, it's a beautiful area of the Mojave Desert. Lake Mead's a great place to visit, and we have a lot of treasures here. Now, I know there's something that you have that's, it means a lot to you. You, you. It resonates with you. What is it? Yes, I have a quote from one of the residents that lived here long ago, and uh, she says, some of the most beautiful memories I have are of Mother Nature. We were richly endowed by her. The mesas and the mountains surrounding our little town of St. Thomas. Sunrise, a beautiful time of the day. Long fingers of golden light fanning across the valley to touch everything and make it new. Our mountains didn't just change their apparel twice a year, they changed four or five times a day. Marva Ray Perkins Sprague. I can't thank you enough, Sky. Thank I really you. It was appreciate a pleasure. it. It was a great morning for me. Thank you. Thank you. What I find so interesting is that I'm sure there was a time when nobody thought that this town would go away. There was 500 people, there was a post office, a school, an ice cream shop, but things changed in the twinkling of an eye, and it all had to do with the water. And then the water receded, and we got to go through and explore the town again. But the water hasn't come back, and again, things are changing. And it just makes me wonder, if we're not careful, what does our past say about our future? In the heart of the Mojave, scientists are working to save a species from extinction, the Armagosa vole. So, Patrick, orient me. Where exactly am I right now? We are in the Pahrump Valley. It's a, a large valley right on the state line with Nevada and California. I'm exploring the Vol's desert habitat with Patrick Donnelly, the executive director of the Armagosa Conservancy. Now tell me about the Vol. How many are there and do they only live in this area? The Vol is endemic to Tacopa Marsh. So Tacopa Marsh is uh, about four or five square mile area where there's a number of springs and these springs feed uh, bulrush habitat, which is where the voles live. There's probably only 50 to 150 of these voles left in the wild. Uh, so it's a critically endangered species. It's actually been called the most endangered mammal in North America. In a world of extinction, efforts to save a tiny mouse-like animal represent no small feat. For those who don't know, what is a vole? Well, many people, when they think of a vole, think of a pest in their front yard eating up their grass. And sure enough, it is a similar, similar creature, but the Amargosa vole is a specific species that's adapted to bulrush habitat in marshes. Uh, it's a small mammal. It's a, about five inches long, two inches tall, and weighs just a couple of grams. And, and why do we care about the vole? Well, the vole is really an indicator of the health of our wetland ecosystems. Uh, as the vole goes, so our water goes. Water preservation in the Pahrump Valley is the top priority for the Armagosa Conservancy. 
a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the Armagosa River and its wildlife. So when I look at this, I see large stretches of beautiful desert, but you see water issues. Tell me what you see. We are in the middle of a flow zone. Water is flowing from Mount Charleston underneath us and across that mountain range out there to the Amargosa River. Historically, there's been much more snow on top of Mount Charleston, but as that water melts, it eventually percolates through this aquifer and to the Amargosa River. So we're really in a very special hydrological place right now. And how far is the river from here? It's about 70 miles from the summit of Mount Charleston to the bottom of the Amargosa River. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? It really is, it's remarkable. So if things don't go well up there on Mount Charleston, the vole way down there suffers and then everybody suffers. That's right, and there's a combination of factors in the water in this valley. Mount Charleston snowpack is one of them, and groundwater pumping in the Pahrump Valley is another. The more water we withdraw from this aquifer for housing and farming and utility scale solar, the less of that water is gonna make it through to the Amargosa River. Let's get further down the road. There's more to see. All right, let's go. The vole serves as an environmental indicator for the health of this entire ecosystem and of the natural resources available to the whole community. So, this is an important spot for the vole, huh? Absolutely, this is ground zero for vole conservation. We are doing this reintroduction here and we really think it's the last best hope for the Amargosa vole. This is our chance to get them to reclaim former habitat and to repopulate this area. UC Davis conducts a breeding program that strives to raise the vole population. Researchers have 80 baby voles ready to be introduced to their habitat. This is a soft release cage. Okay. This is where we're gonna release the voles in a few weeks here. Uh, so this cage provides protection from predators and uh, other influences while they become acclimated to the marsh habitat. And, and this will be their introduction into actual nature, yeah? Yeah, so they're in what's called a mesocosm right now in Davis, where it's a simulated bulrush habitat. So they're already becoming acclimated to the idea of reeds and marshy areas. You got more to show me? Absolutely, let's go check out the heart of the vole habitat. Yeah, let's go. Conservationists hope that the introduction of these captive voles will save the species. Without drastic improvements, the Armagosa vole has a 99% chance of being extinct in the next five years. This is perfect bulrush habitat. It's isolated. It has a steady stream of water coming from the hot springs. Voles thrive in a habitat like this. Bulrush is extremely important. This is not to be considered your average weed. No, definitely not. Bulrush is the best habitat for the vole. And really, uh, in ecological terms, it's what's known as an obligate relationship. The vole has to have bulrush to exist. Now, the vole eats bulrush, it nests in bulrush, and it crawls around in bulrush. We actually have a good example of a tunnel here. This is a vole tunnel. Oh, it's bigger than I thought. It goes way back into the bulrush, and that is where the vole gets around. It gets to its food. Voles are nocturnal creatures, which makes it difficult to catch a glimpse of them in daylight, although we can still identify clues of their existence and behaviors throughout the bulrush. This is an example of something a vole has eaten. They eat the succulent tops off the bulrush, and that is how they survive. That's their main food source. Why can't we just plant this stuff in other places? Because of the water? Well, water conditions are very important to bulrush's existence, and there are certain types of conditions that it grows in. However, that is our next step. We start reintroducing the voles, they establish themselves in the existing bulrush, and then we plant a bunch more bulrush to expand their habitat. That's the real goal here. The captive voles are tagged and outfitted with radio transmitters that allow researchers to track their movements and detect survival for up to a year. Typically, voles live their entire life cycle within a 100-foot radius. So they barely move from one location at all in their whole lives. So there's a good chance that there's one within 100 feet of right here. Very likely, yeah. And we will never see him. <laughs> that is beautifully frustrating. <laughs> well, I think it actually adds to the mystery of the vole, you know? We do all this work out here day in and day out to try to save this critter. We may never see them except when they come into a trap. The overall project will likely take years. For Patrick, this effort is a labor of love love for this little mammal on the verge of extinction. What would you do if this doesn't work? You know, the vole keeps me awake at night. I lay there thinking about saving the vole and what might happen if it does not get saved. It would be just personally devastating to lose this animal. And it would really be an indicator that we're losing something greater in this ecosystem. We're losing our water. And since that is the critical element that makes the Amargosa such a special place, failure is not an option. Well, I can't imagine the vole having a better advocate than you, and that's what allows me to sleep at night. So thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you for coming out here. We appreciate it.
The vole may be a small animal, but it's got a great big impact. And when a lot of people think of Nevada, they think of really rugged features, but it certainly has its delicate parts too. It's just a, a real good thing that there's people who care about those delicate parts as well. Nevada is truly a sportsman's paradise. And today, we're headed to a fishing spot that's popular with anglers seeking trophy-sized fish. This morning, I got up early and I went to my friend Bill's house for a good cup of coffee. He runs the Elko Guide Service. And today, he took us out to the South Fork Reservoir because he swears that this is some of the best fishing in all the land. Hey, Bill, what kind of fish are in this? Lake. There's rainbows, bass, largemouth, smallmouth, uh, big catfish. Bill Gibson is the master guide for the Ruby Crest Ranch near Elko. The ranch offers fishing and hunting expeditions throughout the Ruby Mountains. This is a true story. Last night, I dreamt that I caught a great big catfish. I was so excited about coming out here. I was dreaming about it, but it was huge. It was bigger than the boat. Our destination is the South Fork Reservoir, where I'm hoping my dream will come true. So Bill, tell me about the uh, Ruby Mountains. One of the most beautiful ranges in the state, man. 110 miles long, all kinds of wildlife, fish. The Ruby Mountains got their name in the 1850s, when miners mistakenly thought that the garnets they panned were precious rubies. And how deep is this lake? About 67 feet when it's full. How often do you get out here? <laughs> Seems like 100 days a year anyway, on a good year, 100 days. That's not, that's not a bad life. The reservoir attracts about 100,000 sportsmen and nature lovers every year. Tell me again how the reservoir came about. It was actually funded by taxpayers. Yeah, the, the folks in Elko County passed a, a tax initiative, I guess you'd call it, and then paid for the reservoir to be built and then turned it over to the state for management as a state park. This stream that feeds the reservoir today used to have great fishing in it too. So the minute that this dam was finished, there were already three, four, five pound fish, rainbows in it. Before it became a reservoir, the South Fork area was called Tomara Ranch. In 1983, the Tomara family sold the property to the state of Nevada, which filled the reservoir in 1995. What's your favorite fish story out here on the reservoir? I think I could write a book. <laughs> I better hurry before I forget all of the chapters. <laughs> you know, I've caught a few trout in my day, but I will never profess to be a great fisherman. And I sure do enjoy it. What's your favorite kind of fishing? I like it all. I like, I spend a lot of time fly fishing, but uh, we also have spinning rods, uh, we, we have bait rods, bait casters. We're not opposed to catching them on a worm or a fly or a spinner and whatever puts a wiggle in the rod, John. What do you like best about fishing? Uh, just getting out. I like the eating them, I like the catching them, I like the letting them go. All of it. It's just nice to be on the water, isn't it? Oh man. Oh, there's one, there's a hit. Let's see if we can catch this. There's a little hit. There's one. That way, Bill. Well, he's not in the boat yet, but he's on. Take your, we'll take our time here. All right. Let's see if it jumps. Oh, nice oh, rainbow. Wow. There we go. Look at it. Oh. Lift her up. There's one. That's beautiful. There's your dinner, John. There you go. Or maybe your lunch. There you go. That is a beautiful. Now, how's that for one that cooperates for How us? How about that? I'm gonna hold him this way here. I wanna hold him up. Oh, yeah, look at that. Turned out pretty nice. Look at gorgeous. the colors. Look at the colors on that cheek patch. Wow. What'd you use to catch this? Oh, one? that one hit on a worm. We've been fly fishing, but the wind's blowing so bad. It wasn't a catfish, but it was a beautiful trout. Well, I got a hunch that catfish of yours is in the future. <laughs> On such a windy day, we got really lucky landing this rainbow trout. Guess I'll have to come back for that catfish. Let me tell you how good this guy is. It's very choppy, especially out in the, in the middle of the lake here. 
I, for the first time in a long time, got shut out. He did not. He caught a beautiful rainbow trout, and you know what? Only a guy who really knows what he's doing is gonna be able to catch a fish like that on a day like this. Now this one will take him home and eat him. If that's what you want to do, we'll, we'll cook them up fresh. That's hook, when they're the best. Hook them and cook them, right, Bill? You bet, hook them and cook them. Hey, I didn't catch anything, but you know what? I had such a good time, honestly, I don't care. I, I, today, being out here on the lake with you has just been great. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. Maybe after lunch, we'll get back and do another session. Bill, you don't have to ask me twice. Okay, man. It's an exciting yet serene experience, parasailing. And I'm heading skyward over the crystal blue waters of Lake Tahoe to try it. Just take a look around. Take a look at this. This is the Round Hill Pines Beach Resort in Tahoe. And today I'm meeting with the owner of Action Water Sports. This is Bob. Bob, how are you, sir? Good, John, how are you? Great. Good. This is, this is a fantastic, but what are some of the things that you guys offer out here? Oh, we have jet skiing, we have parasailing, we have boat rentals. Now, how long have you been out here? I've been out here uh, in the water sports business now for 28 years, John. And what brought you out here? Just take a look behind us. Lake Tahoe is just incredible. All right, so today I'm going to sample one of the many activities that they offer. I'm doing a little parasailing. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And you got a crew on there that they know what they're doing. They're safety oriented. They know exactly what's going on. We absolutely have one of the best crews in the country, John. They're going to get you up there. They're going to get you high. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be out about 1,000 feet on the line. Parasailing has been around since the 1960s when a French engineer named Pierre Marcel Limoing developed the ascending gliding parachute. Have you parasailed yourself? Absolutely. And what's the best part? You know, there's two great parts, John. One is just being up there. It's like you're floating in a cloud. Really? You, you're just, there's no pressure, no sense of anything except looking out like you're in a cloud. Now, is there a chance that the, the rope could break and then I could just go flying off into California? The way the system's designed is even if you had some unforeseen event, um, it's still gonna be a safe system. You would just float on down to the water, you're gonna have a life vest on, you would float there in the water, boat would come back, pick you up, and you'd say, that was an awesome ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go meet the crew, I'm gonna go have a little fun. Thanks, Bob. Fantastic, John. Have All a right. great day. All right, see you later. All right. It's time to meet the crew and get ready for my airborne adventure. Wes? That's it. Hey, it's John, how are you? John, good to meet you. Nice seeing you, how's everything? Everything's great. Man, you got a, you got a great job here. Not too bad, I don't complain too much. My captain is Wes Snyder, and he's been parasailing in Tahoe for 12 years. So Wes, how fast does the boat go and how high do I go? It all depends on the, uh, the wind and uh, the, the size of the chute and the, the weight of the person or people in the chute. Um, so anywhere from zero to 25 miles per hour, you're gonna go up a thousand feet of rope. So you're gonna be anywhere from 500 to 700 feet off the water. Wes, I can't wait, let's get started. All right, started. let's do it. All right. Just climb right on. The ride begins on a platform boat. It has a hydraulic winch system that extends out and then reels back in. All right, so this is your harness here. I'm gonna lay this on the ground. You wanna put your feet right through these two loops here. Okay. And then as you stand up, pull those loops over your shorts. There you go. Right. Then I'm gonna have you hold these two uh, clips here. Okay, now you're gonna go ahead and take a seat and you'll see that this goes right under your uh, legs there. Yep. You're gonna be sitting in that just like a swing. You'll be hanging from these. Oh, I got it. And uh, you can hold on right here. We ask that you don't touch the metal clips though, okay? Of course. Excellent, we're ready to go. That's it. That's it. Why, that's simple. Ready to go. Well, almost ready. Can't forget the life vest. Yeah, how's that feel? Outstanding. Perfect. Good Great. All right, Wes, what's next? The inflation process, what does that entail? Well, we already got the chute set up here. Um, basically, all we're gonna do is we're gonna throttle up a little bit, get a little wind in the chute. He's, Sonny's gonna pull on a couple lines, and it's just gonna pop right up. All right, let's go have some fun. Let's do it. Wes inflates the chute, and after a quick hookup, I'm ready to go. Here we go. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I'm flying, baby! Oh, my gosh! This is one of the coolest things I've ever done. It looks a whole lot scarier than it is. The water is so blue. It is so peaceful. Yeah, I'd give this a nine and a half. 
nine and a half on scary, but it's an 11 or 12 on fun. Oh my gosh, I wish everybody in the world could do this. Can you see that? That's about a thousand feet up in the air. I don't mean to brag, but being the host of Outdoor Nevada means I have the best job in the world. It's nearing the end of my flight and I'm being lowered down, but first, a couple of quick dips to get the heart racing. There we go, there we go. Yeah! Woohoo! <laughs> Woo oh my gosh! Okay, stop what you're doing. Whatever you're thinking, and whatever you're doing, you gotta stop what you're doing and start making arrangements to parasail Lake Tahoe. And I'm gonna tell you why right now. Because the rope goes about a thousand feet, but your fears and your cares and your concerns of the world, they only go about five feet. Up there, this complete beauty and complete relaxation and calm. If you've never done this, or if you haven't done it in a while, you have to parasail Lake Tahoe. And just trust me on this one, wow.